So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt McClure. Uh, so I'm going to talk about being the gentle giant uh, and helping people integrate for the long haul. So essentially, helping people get started using an API uh, and then helping them uh, integrate so that they have a stable integration for the duration, so when they scale. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about me. Uh, I work for a company called Brightcove. Uh, so we do pretty much everything you could imagine for uh, distribution and like monetization of video online. Uh, but I'm specifically on the Zencoder team, which is just an API for video transcoding. Uh, and I'm a contributor to Video.js, which is an open source HTML5 video player. Uh, and we just released version 4 like a month ago. So if you haven't checked it out recently, I highly suggest it. But. Uh, so first of all, what, what makes an API good? So everyone here uh, is in some way involved with uh, API development or developing on APIs. Uh, but what makes an API good like to use? Um, <clears throat> And so first of all, it's usefulness. Like, does it perform the task that I need? Like, does this thing do what I want it to do? Uh, pretty simple. So uh, how is its design? Um, you know, do the endpoints that I use make sense? Like, when I just look at an endpoint without any documentation, can I make a good guess as to what that endpoint is going to perform? Uh, and then thirdly is support. So, and, and when I say support, I mean everything from documentation to actually uh, human contact. But uh, providing resources uh, to your users, uh, and especially like human-generated resources to your users. Um, so those, those three things are, are required, at the very least, for, for a good API uh, from a developer's perspective. So you have this good API. Uh, we assume, how do you get people to use it? So first of all, it has to be good. So it has to perform an action, has to be well designed, and you have to actually support it. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, it seems obvious, but you'd be surprised, so. Um, <clears throat> and then the other one, it has to be good enough. I know that sounds kind of weird to say, but uh, at the end of the day, does this thing perform the action uh, that it needs to, like at the most basic level? Um, you know, extra features can come later, but at the very least, you know, for instance, video transcoding. When I send an API request, do I get transcoded videos back? Uh, it just, at the very least, needs to perform the actions that the developer could do on their own. Um, but then you have to add additional benefits, such as support and uh, scalability, or whatever, whatever your magic sauce is in making this thing uh, um, a good tool for a developer's toolkit. So <clears throat> deciding on an API uh, is a big deal, right? Um, you know, APIs can help developers focus more on their application's core competency, like you know, what they are building for this app, uh, rather than um, you know, core, like these additional features. Or, you know, so <clears throat> the issue here is that this abstraction takes control out of their hands, which is terrifying from a developer's perspective, you know, especially uh, before kind of this API revolution took place, every, every little piece of uh, an application, developers could tell you what every line of code did. And these days, it's kind of scary, right? We're, we're relying on these other uh, services to provide um, really important functionality for applications. So, you know, that's terrifying. So when we decide on these APIs, it's really important to look at things like SLAs and, um, you know, their support and all this other stuff just to make sure that... Uh, <coughs> we're comfortable with these people taking control of important aspects of our applications. Um, because if these things go down, or if the API itself goes down, or if the, our integration with the API is buggy, then you know, that can have drastically negative effects. So it's important to take this job seriously. Uh, <clears throat> you know, especially because a lot of times developers are using APIs because they're unable to perform the task themselves. So <clears throat> a good examples of this are things like you know, credit card processing. Uh, like companies like Braintree and uh, Stripe have done all the work with integrating with all of these uh, credit card companies around the world um, and building those relationships for you so that you can just make a simple API call with a credit card number and return back if it's valid or not and then charge that credit card. Um, another good example is things like SMS and voice. So companies like Twilio uh, that have made it so that you can send a text message to somebody with just one uh, JSON request, or you know, receive a phone call from somebody. Like these are things that would have taken developers, whole, like whole teams of developers, months 
and tons and tons of contact with these telcos to just be able to do these things, but it's amazing that you know, we're able to do them with a few API requests. So you know, it's, it's important that you know, we understand that we're performing a very important service for these developers. So uh, <clears throat> it's also important to note that API stability is really important, but it's also a given, right? Like, you know, we have SLAs generally that guarantee that this service will only be down, you know, 0.002% of the time uh, in a month, right? So that's kind of a granted that the API will be available at any time. Um, but the integration with that API can also be uh, a stumbling block, and that can be where failure happens all the time, and more often than not is. So, you know, getting, getting around that. So how do we, you know, help developers integrate to make sure that that integration is stable? Uh, so first of all, uh, and this is, this is in relation to um, building like the quick start guides, right? Uh, when we're building like the simple, you know, this is how you get started with my service. And in three lines of code, you can get started using my service. So when we're writing these things, we have to recognize that developers are going to vary wildly in skill. So uh, from the most novice of the novice to the most, you know, epically expert elite uh, developer, everybody, um, across the spectrum is going to be using your API. So uh, we have to realize that. Um, and so when we're building these, uh, these quick start guides and stuff, easy wins are always fun, right? Like, you know, three lines of code and you're integrated. Wow, that was awesome, right? Everyone likes an easy win. Uh, so it's really helpful because people get to see basic usage, usage examples and uh, they get a quick feel for the service. Um, and the service can show off cool features. You know, like really simple little things that you can do to add value, right? Uh, so all these things are awesome, but the problem is easy ends really quick, especially when it comes to complex API integrations. Uh, so a lot of times if you have these like little quick hacks, they'll never get refactored. That code will just live in this code base. And then, you know, things get tough. The company blows up, it scales, and then all of a sudden you're a horse on a ball. Uh, and a lot of times with these like quick little integration, these quick starts, you, you never get a chance to show best practices. Um, and I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to harp on that a lot, but, uh, you never get to show people how you think they should be using your service. Um, and another one, and this is, this is going to sound kind of mean, but this doesn't exclude non fits. Uh, so as I said, you know, we're developing for, uh, providing an API. You never know who you're going to get in terms of talent and skill. Uh, and sometimes, like the the really starter developer is not your target audience. Um, sometimes it's just maybe too far beyond them at the time. Um, so there's an example. We we wrote a blog post about an integration or how to integrate with File Picker. Um, who all in here has heard of File Picker before? Okay. Well, it's a really cool service for making uploading files really really easy. So just you know four or five lines of JavaScript and you can have like a dialogue pop up that'll let people upload from, you know, a bunch of services or their hard drive or whatever. But regardless, this was a common request that we would get from our customers. Like, okay, I want to transcode video. I want to let my users transcode video. How do I get it to you? Uh, and so file picker made a, made a ton of sense, right? So we wrote this blog post. I wrote this blog post. And uh, in my exuberance for how easy this was, I was like, well, we can just make this really simple, uh, you know, 10 lines of JavaScript and they can upload a file and then send an API request. Uh, and it was all done on the client side, right? And so the problem is I was putting the Zencoder API key in client side JavaScript, and this is a full read write API key. You know, and under it, I had this big disclaimer, like, don't do this in production. That's you know, this, is, this goes without saying, this is a bad idea, this is client-side JavaScript. Anybody could view your source, get your API key, and then transcode 2 million minutes of video, and, you know, we're going to bankrupt you. Uh, <clears throat> but regardless of all of these disclaimers, you know, for the next month or so, we'd get requests like, hey, uh, you know, I'm having trouble getting this work. Would you mind taking a look at the code? And when they'd send us their code, it would be the exact example from the blog post. You know, and so I remember one in particular, you were like, this is a really bad idea. You shouldn't be doing this. You should actually be doing the API request in the back end, uh, you know, where you can have your API key secure and you can even, you know, have more control over making sure they don't modify your Zencoder request and all this other stuff. 
And we're like, so, but we can help you write this. Like, what's your, uh, what's your backend written in? And they responded with, uh, it's PHP and Java, of course, uh, which it, it wasn't. It was PHP and JavaScript. But, you know, regardless, this is an example of somebody that ultimately is probably going to cost more to try to support them and get them integrated than they're ever going to uh, give back. And I know that sounds really callous, but especially when you're talking about, you know, at first, if you, if you just have a few users, it can make sense. But once you start needing to scale, uh, it's just not scalable to provide this kind of support to every novice developer that comes in. So, <clears throat> um, but as I said, <clears throat> one really important thing I think is to talk and educate people about best practices. So obviously, you know, these, this is the world of open APIs. So one of the big things that we espouse all the time is letting people do what they want with your API, right? Blank canvas, as uh, we heard in the first talk. Um, but it can be a black, blank canvas and also building blocks, as he said. So it's important to kind of tell people how, what the best way is to put these building blocks together, get them started, right? Um, and you should do this through guides, and you should do this through blog posts, and you should do this for every kind of documentation that you have and you should do it in support emails and support phone calls, and you should do it when you go to dinner with their family, or you know, whatever else. Anytime you can tell somebody about how you think, uh, the ways you think that this integration works the best, um, you should be doing it. You should help them. Um, <clears throat> and one way that you can kind of help people get started is through uh, providing integration libraries. Uh, so an important thing to note here is that even though I think integration libraries are a great way to help people get started, uh, with like the most basic best practices for interacting with your API. Ultimately, these things should just get out of the way. Uh, it should just be a really thin wrapper uh, around your uh, API. And you shouldn't try to do or abstract too much when you're doing this. Because otherwise, uh, maintainability is just going to be a nightmare, especially when your list of integration libraries grows. Uh, you don't want to have to update every one of those every time you add a parameter. Um, you know, obviously major version changes where you add a whole endpoint, obviously there's going to have to be some updating there, but uh, little, little minor version um, bumps shouldn't affect your integration libraries in the slightest bit. So I think one of the most important things that we learned along the way was, was this, especially with, with writing Zen Coder library. So um, some of our first few, like the PHP library, uh, we, would, we would handle a lot for you, such as like, the, the return notification when a video is finished. We would handle some like parsing and like, you know, kind of get you started. And it was, it was great, um, but that library does the most for you and it's been the biggest nightmare in terms of issue list on GitHub and supporting people. Um, you know, our, our Ruby, Ruby library and Node libraries are just, you pass an API request and we just essentially like post to a certain endpoint or get or put. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's just a really thin wrapper, and we ha have almost no problems uh, in terms of issues or support. Uh, and, and every time we release an upgrade, we almost never have to do anything. Uh, so you know, that's important, uh, especially as you have more than two or three integration libraries. Uh, <clears throat> so, and this kind of goes with, with best practices as well, but provide feedback. So have your developers' backs. Like, be proactive with letting them know how they're doing in terms of interacting with your API. Uh, so don't just wait for things to break uh, and for them to send you a support email. Um, like when you see potential issues and shortcomings with how they're building on top of you, uh, you need to let them know. Um, so like, like for instance, you know, we can, if with, with the Zencoder API, you can either pass an API key through in the request body uh, or as a header. Um, and for security reasons, we always suggest putting it in the uh, header. <clears throat> so, I mean, that's not going to break anything either way, but we should still be careful about like, letting them know about security. So sending that, it takes two seconds to send that person a quick email and say, hey, you know, I've been noticing you've been including your, your API key in your request body. Uh, that's, that's fine. It'll still work. But for security reasons, you should consider moving it to a header. I mean, it takes, just takes a few minutes, and people will love you for it. Uh, so post integration, uh, so once a customer is up and running, uh, this is where the real support 
begins. And this is where the real fun starts. So, you know, we, we all like to think that support looks like it does on all the stock photos on every website that you see, where it's just a smiling, happy person that's, you know, really happy to answer your emails and get on the phone with you. Um, but if you've ever answered a support email, you know, it looks probably a lot more like this, like just facepalm after facepalm. And, you know, so, some days are better than others, but, you know, sometimes support is really frustrating and it's not fun but it's a necessary evil. So uh, how can we like help people not email us, right? That's the most important thing is if a person's not emailing you about support, then things are going smoothly. Um, so be upfront, for instance, about, about downtime or potentially breaking changes. So as soon as you know that you're going to have like downtime that wasn't scheduled, uh, let everyone know, like as soon as possible. Um, and eventually, you'll have to deploy a change uh, that will break things. Um, that's just the nature of the beast. Eventually, uh, something you do will break things for users. Uh, <clears throat> so what you need to do is find all potentially affected users, test their recent requests, and then contact them. Uh, so we had to do this with Zencoder recently. Um, we're a Rails app. Uh, and when the you know, YAML security vulnerability hit. Uh, if you're not familiar, it was a vulnerability in how the, how the parser worked. Um, so we had to switch our parser out for a, uh, for a new one um, that didn't, wasn't affected by this vulnerability. And the problem was this new parser was stricter than the old one. So that doesn't seem like a big deal because you know, everybody always posts perfectly correct JSON all the time, right? But <clears throat> it did cause a lot of issues. So we, we looked through all of our API requests for the last you know, month, uh, maybe a little bit more, and then tested each one of those against this new parser to see if errors would come up. And for every account where errors came up, we emailed them. Uh, and then we emailed them again. And then we emailed them again. Uh, and a lot of these people never got back to us, never obviously just dumped the email off, uh, or we didn't have an up-to-date contact. But sure enough, when we pushed the changes, we got a lot of emails from people saying, your, you know, your service is broken. My old API requests aren't working anymore. Uh, and that frustrates people. So you're never going to be able to catch everyone, but at least you can try. So, and, and that's, that's the most important thing. Um, and another thing is to ask for feedback, right? So this won't necessarily allow you to find bugs because your bugs are going to come through in support requests, right? Um, but it'll help you find annoyances which is just as important for the developer experience. Well, maybe not just as important, but it is still really important for the, for the developer experience. You know, as, as in the talks this morning, when you see like the bunch of little things that add up to an unhappy developer, uh, you know, this is one way to kind of get around that, right? So just, just communicating with developers, finding out what they like, what was maybe a little annoying, how you could improve your documentation. Uh, it just lets developers know you care. Um, you know, and, and we like to feel cared for. It's, it's, always, it's always good to know that you're loved by your service. Um, and people just like giving input anyway. So uh, it'll keep some support emails out of your inbox, and your developers will love you for it. Uh, and so just, you need to take pride. You know, whether we're using these APIs, or that we're, whether we're consuming them, or building on top of them, uh, you know, the world of open APIs that's, that exists right now is, is really incredible. Uh, and we're really lucky to be a part of it. So you know, as both consumers and producers of these services, I think we can all just take a second and like, think about how awesome this is, that what we, we live in now and not having to deal with the APIs or non-existent APIs of, uh, you know, the early 2000s. So uh, <clears throat> that's pretty much all I have today. Um, so if there are any questions or anything, uh, you know, my name's Matt. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we have a table outside. So if there's anything else later, just come find me. Thanks.